Thanks uh, to the Western Front Association, of course, for giving me a platform tonight and uh, for extending the invitation. And thanks to all of you out there who are watching, no matter if you're back home in Canada or, as I presume, most of you are in the UK. So uh, tonight, what I'd like to do is to tell you a bit of a story, maybe with a bit of a different perspective than what we're used to talking about in the English speaking world, or let's say the former British Empire, the Commonwealth. Um, about the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which I suppose to get us in the mood a little bit of perspective changing and, and looking at things maybe from the German experience and the German point of view, uh, we should call the Schlacht auf der Vimy Höhe as part of the Osterschlacht by Arras. So basically the Battle of Vimy Ridge as a part of the larger Battle of Arras in the spring of 1917, which the Germans refer to as the Easter Battle of Arras. Now I chose uh, a little bit of a, a title that I wanted to connect to this idea of different perspectives and connecting what we know about the British and Canadian experience on the Western Front with what maybe we're a bit less familiar with in the German experience. Of course, it's referencing doomed youth. The Germans at Vimy Ridge references this very famous Wilfred Owen poem. He doesn't actually list the nationality or mention the nationality of the soldiers that he is um, writing the poem about. And I thought it might be a nice little twist uh, to start that way with a picture by the uh, one of the official Canadian war photographers, William Ivor Castle, of two German prisoners of war who were captured at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. And we're going to see quite a few other examples of Germans at the battle as well. Uh, in the next 50 minutes or so, if I can keep to time, which I can tell you right now is going to be a struggle, but I'll do my best. I want to set a few expectations as well for tonight. I'm not trying to present something that is new scientific research that I've discovered about the battle that's never been heard of before. What I want to do is tell you the story of this German experience at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Usually, we only hear about the, the one side, but now, 100 years later, I feel like it's something that we don't have to be worried about. It's something that can benefit our understanding of the conflict and of the experience of the men who were there, in this case, on the other side of the hill. It's not going to be complete in the time that we have. Of course, this is quite a large battle involving three German divisions of the Vimy group, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, so it's just going to be an overview with a few selected points, I think, where we can we can get into different types of experiences that the Germans have and compare them to what we know from British and Canadians that we're more familiar with. Now, when we visit the memorial today, and you can tell this is a real picture that I took because it's crooked. So nothing here is uh, is stock footage, folks. It's all the it's all the real thing. I visited. On a very rare, nice day in, in November of last year, on Armistice Day, on Remembrance Day, when we visit the memorial, of course, there's not much trace of the Germans who occupied the ridge for four years and of the many thousands of Germans who left their lives on the ridge either, which is understandable given the way the war turned out and given the political atmosphere in the decades following. But nonetheless, this is something when I was working as a tour guide on the ridge that I that I ended up thinking of quite a lot. What about the Germans whose trenches were right there where you see those people walking and where we've many of us presumably have also walked up towards the memorial. And when we look at a view like this from uh, one of the little roads on the site where they've left without trees, we can get this spectacular view of the memorial to the Canadians. Well, basically that view and that that gap that we see in April 1917 is, of course, paved with, well, for lack of a better word, German corpses. And that is a bit of a dramatic way of stating it, and Canadian ones as well, of course, that is, is uh, assumed. Uh, it's a dramatic way of saying it, but I think that is, uh, you know, that's what it boils down to, and that's why it's worth, I think, investigating 
what many of those men experienced um, on those on those four days in April 1917. So I'm not going to make any assumptions about knowledge tonight. I don't know every last button and uniform and bayonet that was in use in the German army on Vimy Ridge. This is the human story that we're going for this evening. Um, so I'll start with a very brief introduction to the situation in Germany in early 1917. What's happening? Uh, oh yeah, here was, a, I'm speaking from notes. I don't have a teleprompter, I don't have a script. So this will be uh, natural and a bit messy. So um, this is the kind of map I think we often see when we're thinking about the battle. And of course, you have the Canadian units indicated there or up to, up to the brigade level in any case, but not the German ones. So again, there's this kind of gap that we sometimes, uh, that we sometimes come up against. Uh, for tonight's talk, I used some published material, right? There's some stuff, some good stuff that's been written by historians like Jack Sheldon or uh, Jonathan Boff wrote a great book about uh, Hegg's main opponent, the crown prince. But I also dipped into some older sources in German. These three I have on my shelf here uh, behind me or next to me, just off camera, and managed to teach myself how to read the fractal script from the time. And so that's where we're going to draw our examples from tonight. As far as Germany is concerned, in the spring of 1917, it's in a bit of a tight spot. Now, not to say that the Allies are not, but the Germans are in a difficult situation. Most Germans still support the war, but the war effort is taking its toll. There are awful food shortages. The winter of 1916-17 is the infamous turnip winter, Steckrübenwinter, where the British blockade or the Allied blockade starts to really take its toll and there's hunger and there's disease related to malnutrition. And that's why you have posters like this because there's such a shortage of basic foodstuffs in particular fats and oils. This is a poster encouraging Germans to collect um, fruit pits in order that they might then be processed and crushed to have the little oil that's in them squeezed out so it could be used to get the population more calories. So this is you know, one example of the, the dire straits that Germany is in, even though on the front, they are still more or less holding as we'll get into. The situation at home, of course, Germany is starting to exhaust its uh, manpower resources. So here's a little postcard I found at a, a flea market, which is kind of making light a little bit of the new reality, which is that women are driving trams, which was not the case in pre-war Germany. And it's that way, not because there was a sudden explosion of a women's rights movement, but because there are not enough men who are not serving in uniform to fulfill these kinds of services. So these small things are signs of pressure, of course. And the watchword is durchhalten, which means, you know, holding out. And this is another little uh, postcard, and it says at the bottom there, wir stehen Eisen, which means like we stand as firm and as strong as iron. Well, maybe it was that way on the postcards, but the society, the economy, and the army are under a lot of pressure. Might not have seemed that way to the British and French troops going over the top against well-built and well-armed uh, German trenches, but that is indeed the situation. Um, Germany, of course, by this time has uh, become a military dictatorship under Hindenburg and Hindenburg and uh, Ludendorff. They're essentially running the country uh, on behalf of everybody else. And the army is also starting to change the way that it uh, the way that it works. Here we see the Western Front in early 1917. The German army took such severe losses at Verdun and on the Somme that they took quite a dramatic strategic decision to pull back. And we can see that little red indicator there, Hindenburg line. So they pull back to save space, shorten the line. And this is a sign of pressure. It's a sign of weakness. Um, Vimy is still anchoring the area kind of to the northern part of the Hindenburg line, but nonetheless, the Germans find themselves forced to take this step. On the plus side, from the German point of view anyway, in March, of course, there's a revolution in Russia. So 
it's not a bad thing if one of the main enemies is uh, is unstable. The problem is the provisional government that takes over after the Tsar uh, abdicates. And this is not yet the Bolsheviks, of course. They will come then in October. The provisional government wants to continue the war. So this is a bit of a mixed, uh, a mixed situation as well. Uh, oh, I should have mentioned, of course, we call it the Hindenburg Line, but the Germans don't call it that. They call it the Siegfriedstellung, the Siegfried position. Siegfried is a Germanic hero from the sagas and so on and so forth. You get the idea of why they would, why they would call it that. I guess he didn't live up to, uh, to, his, uh, to his performance in those sagas, but that's another story. So uh, the Germans also decide to take some risks, which is a sign of this pressure, right? In February, they launch once again for the second time, unrestricted submarine warfare. And that is eventually going to backfire on them. But at the moment, this seems like one of the only chances. Ludendorff actually admits in uh, late 1916 that he doesn't see a way to force a military victory anymore in the West. So these things are known by the time that the Battle of Vimy Ridge uh, take place. They're not known to most of the men, perhaps uh, in the trenches there necessarily, but that's the general situation. The ridge, of course, is one of the more imposing tactical positions, let's say, and the Germans have held it since 1914, right? This was one of the positions they decided to keep when they basically made the choice of which ground to defend uh, in 1914. And I was lucky enough to come across a series of photos from a private uh, estate from German positions on Vimy Ridge in 1915. So now we're going to start getting a taste of what was it like for the German soldiers? What did it look like in, uh, on Vimy Ridge? A little bit before, of course, the British and then later the Canadians arrived. So when the French are still there, here we see a typical trench scene in this private photograph. There's your usual German machine gun up there. Obviously, the photographer is... Uh, making sure that he's safe and sound because of the angle. You can see we're deep in the trench, so not exposed. Here we've got an officer next to what might be the entrance to a dugout, what might be the entrance to a mining or a fighting tunnel, something along those lines. Here we have, uh, this one isn't the greatest quality, but this is the village of Vimy, which is just behind German lines, behind the ridge, little cavalry, Patrol. We're going to see the, the village looks much different uh, in 1917 to what it looks like here in 1915. And then we've got a crew of Germans as well trying to observe what are the French doing down there on the lower part of the ridge in 1915. I also want you to take note of the types of trenches here. They are still fairly primitive. The German trenches of the 1917 are going to be uh, a bit more complex affairs and a little bit more difficult to take as well. And here is a visit from the Chancellor, Bet um, Holweg, Betman Holweg, who came to visit apparently, I'm still trying to track down a confirmation of this uh, from his side, um, but that, uh, that is outstanding for the moment. But I thought it was pretty interesting to come across um, Betman Holweg on Vimy Ridge in 1915. Of course, the French do almost take it from the British, there's still a Moroccan memorial on the top of the ridge from when they made it to the crest very near to where the big Canadian memorial is today in, in May, 1915, and then they were pushed back. So, um, uh, here's what it might look more or less for a German looking out uh, from Vimy Ridge. This is not Vimy Ridge. This is the Loretto Hill, Notre Dame de Lorette, which is very close. So we are looking from a German position in 1915 towards the villages of Suchet and then after that Vimy. So Vimy Ridge is, is actually just on the horizon there that we can see. But it's a symbol, symbolic picture. Now here is what the German defenses start looking like by 1917. Since they lost too many men in the frontline trenches in 1916, they try to adopt a new method of defense. Not only do they retreat to the kind of 
much better constructed Hindenburg line in 1917, they also adopt a defense in depth. So the idea there is that you can hold your front line much more thinly, and you expect that the enemy is going to penetrate a few lines of trenches. And so instead of packing those frontline trenches with men, you're going to have far fewer men in the frontline trenches, but you're going to have some mutually supporting strong points, often with concrete and usually machine gun uh, positions. So this kind of allows the defender to advance somewhat, but then they come up against these mutually, mutually um, supporting strong points and they will eventually exhaust themselves, at which point the Germans plan, they can bring up reserves and counterattack the weakened and exhausted attackers and push them back. So without sacrificing too much, with getting, well, forgive the expression, but more bang for your buck, from the defense in depth with the isolated, or not the isolated, but the, the individual strong points that, that have uh, reinforcing fields of fire, they're going to be able to defend more efficiently with fewer losses for themselves. That's what they're going for. That's what they want to apply at Vimy. Save on manpower, exact a higher cost from a more numerous enemy. And uh, these trenches are on Vimy Ridge, and they're a lot more substantial than the ones that we just saw in those pictures from 1915. Not quite as luxurious as this German postcard with you know basically a nice little uh, wooden home being built there, but certainly more substantial than your average British or French trench and dugout, right? The Germans have the luxury of defending if they so choose, they're in enemy territory. The allies are under pressure to, um, to attack. So, uh, here's a few examples after the battle of some reinforced German positions for artillery in this case, or here what was likely a machine gun position on the ridge with Canadian troops taking a rest after mopping up. I don't want to jump ahead to the end of the battle, but I want to show you a few examples of some of the German positions. You can still see one on the ridge uh, if you're looking at the memorial from behind it to the left in the field there in the, in the grassy area, you can still see one that looks a bit similar to the top of this one here in this photograph. So the next time I have me, you can check that out and maybe uh, think about this evening's talk. So who are the Germans? This was unfortunately the best picture I could find of uh, one of their commanders from Fassbender. He's the core commander. So he's the commander of the Gruppe Vimy, the Vimy group, which contains three uh, divisions, two Bavarian, one Prussian. There's also a neighboring Bavarian division that is partially involved uh, down at, in the south. They're part of the sixth army under General von Falkenhausen. Um, the division that gets the most attention, let's say, in, in uh, most histories, is the Prussian 79th Reserve Division. So yes, we have two Bavarian divisions on the other side, but this 79th Prussian division is sitting right on the toughest part of the ridge for the Canadians to take, which is where the monument stands now. It's also, no coincidence, the highest part of the ridge. So that part's defended by Prussians. And their commander is von Dieterich, is his name, and we'll hear from him again a little bit later. Now, this is your typical view of the ridge, but this is kind of the Canadian view. Right, And if you visited the sites, you, you know that it doesn't really scream ridge until you're up at the monument. If you're down where the reconstructed trenches are, where the Canadians jumping off point is, and where the German first line defenses are, it just looks like a gentle slope. You wouldn't necessarily know it's a ridge until you come up to the eastern flank of it. And we'll see, I'll show you on a map in a moment here. But this is what it looks like from the German rear lines point of view. So you can see there's a much more dramatic rise. This is from the, uh, this is from the village of Vimy, which this is how it ends up looking uh, just after the war. So it's been flattened. Far cry from the 1915 picture that we saw. So this is the, the steep part of the ridge that the Germans are looking at as they come up to go onto the top of the ridge to take their place in front line 
uh, positions. Oh, I should mention, of course, that the estimates for the German Corps defending the ridge is somewhere between 30 and 45,000 men. And facing them, of course, are the Canadian Corps with 120,000 men. Now, not all those are frontline soldiers in the trenches, but it gives you an idea of the approximate proportions. Um, and here we see, I think, a bit better of a, a more balanced map where we can see on the right-hand side some of the German designations. Again, this is mostly the most prominent position is the 79th Reserve Division from Prussia. And we can see that they've divided the ridge into different sectors. They're named. Uh, there are more in the Bavarian sectors as well, but for now we can, we can look at those. Fischer, Zollern, and Arnulf. Each one's defended by a regiment. Um, and here we see a German trench map from one of the post-war books from the early 1920s. This is the area, I guess I'll put my cursor here, this area right here where I'm circling, so near the Fisher sector, defense sector, is where the monument stands today. So now, of course, physically they've changed the ridge to accommodate the monument to some extent, but I always think it's interesting to look at this other way of looking at it. Here we have the German second position, the second line of defense on the just past the ridge, so on the lowlands, on the back slope, the, you can see here it says Zweite Stellung, second position. And then all the way over here, the black menacing, not detailed, right? So kind of the flip side, no details here, the Canadian line. Um, and of course, all these trenches are then renamed after once the Canadians take them into, uh, into English names, but you have things like Prinz Heinrich Weg or Kaiser Wilhelm Weg. And I don't know, I, I think it's interesting. They've nicknamed this wood down here, Zahnstocherwald or Weltchen, which basically means toothpick wood. So they, they are experiencing the same kind of battlefield as allied soldiers are, which is of course clear. I'm sure that's not news to you, but I always find it's interesting to get that little flavor of how they would nickname things based on that kind of uh, experience in that landscape as well. Toothpick wood. All right. So what are the Germans thinking? Here we see a, a 210 millimeter um, howitzer in a German position in, on the Arras front. So I don't know if this is exactly behind Vimy or somewhere in the neighborhood, it's as close as I could get. They know that an attack is coming, um, but they don't know exactly when. And that's pretty nerve wracking. I mean, I think we often think about the allied stresses of war as, oh, I know the attack is coming. I'm waiting for the whistle to go off and I'm gonna go over the top. And we think of that as one of the most stressful experiences, kind of a typical stressful experience in the war. For most of the war in the West, the Germans are defending. So their kind of typical stressful experience isn't, isn't as often going over the top to attack as it is waiting for the enemy to attack. Probably just as stressful, but in a different way, in a mirrored um, kind of way. They know that an attack is coming because, of course, they can observe preparations. They have also captured Canadians who were uh, conducting numerous trench raids in the weeks leading up to the attack and the Canadians spilled the beans. And uh, so the Germans know that at some point an attack is coming. Interestingly enough, we often on, on the Allied side concentrate on how strong this position was, right? This is why it's often seen as a very significant military achievement to have been able to capture the ridge in such short order and so on and so forth. And on the one hand, that's true. It is a strong position. They have command of the area, right? They have the high ground. They've worked on the defenses. Those units, the German units, are not necessarily poor quality uh, units. They are mostly reservists, but it doesn't mean that they're poor uh, quality units. Um, but the German commanders are worried about this position before the attack takes place. They see vulnerabilities in the Vimy position. And 
those are two in, in, in theory uh, or in practice as well, actually. I would say they were worried about the depth, right? Remember, the idea is defense in depth and that we want to draw in the British or the Canadians or the French and wear them down, exhaust them in thick losses, and then counterattack. But the ridge is narrow at the top. I don't know. Can I go back? Uh, yeah. So up at Hill 145, the most important part of the ridge, the most imposing defensive position, look how narrow it is compared to where it fans out uh, towards the village of Telu, for example, or Farbu down uh, towards the bottom. So you don't have depth to work with if you're the Germans, right? This is, uh, this is a problem. If you're supposed to defend in depth and you only have a thousand yards or 1200 yards or whatever it is at the, at the top, it's about a thousand meters. Um, this is a vulnerability and the, and the German commanders were concerned about that. In addition, they weren't really able to change the culture of the army fast enough so that all of the officers in all of the different positions of responsibility were implementing the defense in depth by spring 1917. The German army is massive. We're talking about, of course, millions of people. And it takes time for an institution of that size that has a lot of daily problems to solve to implement a new technique, a new tactic like the defense in depth. So some units were behind others in implementing this just because of that organizational culture issue. And then on top of that, you have the problem that the best part of your defensive position doesn't really allow you to implement your new defensive tactic very easily. So let me just check how I'm doing on time. Probably terrible. Oh, way behind schedule, but that's all right. We'll get there. So um, one of the problems as well, of course, is that the German artillery is inferior in number, especially to the British and Canadian artillery in this sector quite significantly. And in the lead up to the battle, the British artillery, primarily Canadian as well, is able to suppress about 80% of the German guns. And we can see in this illustration, dramatic illustration from this post-war popular history book, um, this is not a triumphant you know, artillery crew taking it to the enemy. This is misery, hard work, uh, a dark, you know, you don't see their faces, they're pulling it by hand. It was not a fun time to be a German gunner in the lead up to the battle. In fact, the Germans called the week leading up to the battle, as some of you may have heard, the week of suffering, the Leidenswoche. And this affects the infantry as well. The 79th uh, Division, for example, that Prussian division holding the higher part of the ridge, they're down to about 60 men per company by the time the Canadians are ready to attack. So this numerical advantage is quite, uh, quite significant. Here again, we see the effect of Allied shelling on the village just behind German lines, the village of Vimy. And here we see from the Vimy sector, a bit of a post uh, affair, obviously, in happier times of dogs and, and passenger pigeons coming in. But it's guys like these who are waiting and who are under this shelling, waiting and waiting for the attack to come. Um, von Fassbender, he puts out a, like an order of the day on the day of the attack. Now, because the attack begins at 5.30 in the morning, it's not quite so sure how many of the German soldiers would have uh, heard this, even if he drew it up sort of the day before. But nonetheless, I want to read you this order of the day for the Vimy Corps, the German Vimy Corps, just to give you a feeling, right? So order of the day for the German Vimy Corps. Soldiers, the day of the decisive assault draws near. It will demand nothing less than a supreme performance from all ranks. Be ready at all times to begin the defense. The British, well, he means Canadians, but I won't hold them. I won't hold uh, that against him. The British must not be allowed to gain one single foot of ground. Wherever they succeed in breaking in, they must be ejected without delay. Do not forget that here we are facing the enemy which actually caused this dreadful war, who alone bears the guilt that it is still continuing. You all know what is at stake, victory and peace. 
So this is another part of the German viewpoint is that the Brits are the main bad guys because they jumped into the war late and messed up Germany's entire calculation. And from the German point of view, they jumped in without a good reason. Not saying I subscribe to that view, but that is obviously one of the very deeply held beliefs that informs this message from the Corps commander to the troops on the eve of the attack. On the same day, the eve of the attack, there's a German lieutenant, a man by the name of Runge, and he's on his way up to the front line. He has the bad luck of having his turn uh, in the front line trenches, and he runs into a friend of his, another officer called Heineke. And he tells his friend, if the English attack tomorrow, my dear Heineke, you won't see me again. And well, since I'm choosing that as an example, you can imagine what happened to Lieutenant Runge on the following day. He was killed by Canadian hand grenades somewhere on the ridge. Don't know exactly where. So what happens on the night when the attack goes in? Here we've got another typical image we often associate with the battle. This is the Canadian and British, primarily British from the artillery point of view, fire plan, right for this rolling barrage. So every one of those little lines is a sheet of fire, of exploding shrapnel and high explosive that's hopping, uh, hopping ahead, crashing into the German trenches and being followed then by the Canadian infantry. What is that like if you're on the receiving end, right? Um, here's a, a picture taken by Canadian photographers. So this up there, those explosions we see, that is April 9th, 1917. That is the rolling barrage starting to fall on German lines. And I sometimes wonder, you know, okay, we see this from the Canadian point of view, but over there, who's under that shell? Who's under that explosion? Who's being killed by it? And that's a question that has led me to be interested in this, uh, in this particular topic, right? The whole industrial production, the military might of the biggest empire in the world is falling on the heads uh, in a way of these few thousand Germans on Vimy Ridge. It's quite a dramatic um, thought in a way. So, and same here, this is a famous picture advancing with, with those shells. Here is maybe, as close as we can get to an equivalent on the other side, this is a British or a Canadian shell exploding, a heavy shell. That's what it says down at the bottom. A heavy shell hits um, near the village of Vimy, where there's still a few ruins. I hope the photographer, I mean, I, it seems like maybe he was far enough away. But that is essentially, you know, we, we think about this going over the top idea. On here are some of the results illustrated in one of these 1920s, uh, history books where we can see, you know, the Germans are crowded in their trenches. They're trying to take cover. Um, one of them is sort of in a bit of a heroic pose uh, being hit. You see the dugout entrance being obscured by debris in spite of the horseshoe. So this is that kind of fear. You're stuck in your hole and everything is exploding around you. Um, and your artillery is not answering if you're the Germans. Why? Because they're less numerous in the first place by a wide margin and 80% are suppressed. An infantryman's worst nightmare is that his artillery is not doing anything, or these days his air force is not able to do much. But at the time, you really rely on your artillery to get you out of a jam. And the Germans can't do that. They don't have that uh, at Vimy Ridge. Um, here we see another image, famous image uh, from this book of the 79th division struggling on Vimy Ridge. Um, so what happens is here's a German mortar, for example, from a, a sort of a protected position. You can see they've cleared away some of the brush there. Here are some German supply trains uh, behind Vimy Ridge, but obviously not on the day of the battle because those supply trains were going nowhere uh, during the battle. That was the job of the British artillery to cut them off. So if you're in the German infantry, uh, you, you're in a rough spot because you're cut off from, from uh, reinforcements, from resupply, your artillery is not very effective. And the enemy is coming, right? The enemy is coming. And so 
I want to share a few accounts of the day in the time that we uh, that we have left about uh, some different individual experiences, right? Now, in theory, if if you're a German infantryman on the ridge and you see the Canadians are advancing, they've captured trenches and parts of trenches on either side of you or what have you, you're supposed to keep resisting until the counterattack comes and relieves you and pushes the enemy back. Well, obviously, counterattack at Vimy never came, and we'll get to that in a moment if we have time. But I want to share a few accounts. I want to start with uh, Grenadier Otto Schröder. Not every German in the First World War is called Otto, but this guy does happen to be. I know it always sort of works out that way. He's in the 79th Division in the 262nd Regiment. So he's just south of the memorial amongst the positions there. He had the bad luck to draw sentry duty for the middle of the night shift from April 8th to 9th. So he just got relieved and is trying to go to sleep in his dugout when the bombardment begins at like 5, 5.30 in the morning. So his job is to bring hand grenades in their cases out of the dugout into the trench when the, when the fighting begins. But things happen so quickly that the Canadians break through his unit or the unit next to his, I should say, and they start to outflank his position. And his commanding officer yells that the Canadians are coming. And so he rushes up out of the dugout to try to escape. You don't want to be stuck in a dugout, right? Again, this idea of our kind of imagination of the scariest thing is going over the top and exposing yourself. Well, for the Germans, it's usually staying below and being buried, right? So it's to the flip side uh, of that coin is kind of what's in the German imagination as the most awful, most common uh, type of trauma uh, in the war. So Grenadier Schröder rushes up and all of a sudden he doesn't see anyone. He doesn't see any of his German comrades in the trench anymore from his section. There's just one that's dead lying there and that's it. But in the next trench over or around the bend, he looks over the parapet and he sees what he calls straw hats. This is what they called the, the British and Canadian helmets, right? The Brody helmets, because they looked like a, a sort of summer straw hat a little bit with a thin, thin brim. Um, and by the way they're behaving, he thinks they're drunk. This is a common thing to think about the enemy, no matter, no matter what war, what side. He thinks that the Canadians there are drunk and he's afraid. So he lays down next to his dead comrade and he pretends to be dead. A Canadian comes down the trench, according to Schröder, bayonets the corpse next to him. So <laughs> he jumps up and surrenders. The Canadian says something, something to him, but he has no idea what the Canadian is saying. And then the Canadian moves on. So Schröder doesn't know what to do. Now there's no one around again. He decides to make a run for it. So he starts running, doesn't exactly know where the new German line is. So he's running back. He meets another German accidentally who's in the same position. They start running back together. He gets shot through the arm, still can't find any friendlies. So they decide to take shelter in a dugout. And of course, the battle is raging around them and shells are exploding while this is happening. Um, so they get to the dugout, they go into the entrance and they sit on the stairs. And they start to say, okay, what are we gonna do? Where do we think our guys are, right? How do we get out of this? All of a sudden, from down below, out of the dugout, up come Canadians. They were already in the position and already taking a break, one, one presumes, um, in the dugout. So then, of course, Schroeder was taken prisoner. He survives the war, and he wrote his memoir, including that story afterwards. And I just think it's a good example of that chaos, right? How fast things happen, that things are kind of in flux. One moment you're with your comrades, the next moment you're not, the next moment you're sort of being taken prisoner, the next moment you're alone again and you have a difficult decision to make. You don't know where your own are, you don't know where the enemy are. This is the experience of a soldier in the field who's on the losing side, right? Extreme, uh, extreme confusion. Um, I wanna talk about the story now of Captain Bermann, 
who was also in the 79th division, but further north in the Fisher sector. So right around the memorial. So if you're walking up to the memorial, somewhere within a couple hundred meters of you, this story happens from, from Captain Berman. So he's in a trench called the Berliner Riegel, and he's responsible for um, a machine gun position, among others. But And here's his experience of the start of the battle. Of the first three British waves, almost nothing remained. But then there was a stoppage in the machine gun belt, which could not be cleared. Frantic efforts, shaking and pulling, could achieve nothing. Having soaked up dirt and moisture for days, the belt was jammed and could not be freed. Shot through the head, Corporal Neumann fell, as did the rest of his crew, together with a large group manning the trench. Some brave lads rescued the machine gun and carried it into an adjacent post. To the front, the enemy, who'd been pressing strongly, were pinned down in the muddy craters by the fire of the remaining infantrymen. So, I mean, the guys on the other side are from British Columbia, they're from Mississauga, Ontario, they're from Montreal, the 87th Battalion, and Captain Behrman and his men are trying to kill them. Um, and what makes the difference between who kills whom and who lives and who dies in this case is how much dirt has soaked in to a German machine gun belt. Right, that's kind of that's what I always think of when I when I think of that story. I mean, Gefreiter Neumann wouldn't have been shot through the head probably if that belt hadn't malfunctioned. And who knows how many Canadians might have been shot if it hadn't malfunctioned. Um, there's another officer of the 261st who left an interesting account, um, an officer by the name of um, of Hagemann. So he's in the same area where the Canadians really struggle at the start of the battle around the memorial. And Hagemann says this, our machine guns in flanking positions had a great effect and struck down rows of Englishmen, but the German artillery barrage did no harm to the British infantry. The enemy artillery was very well placed and as the attack made progress, it was always just a little forward of the British infantry. This and the immediate heavy British rifle and machine gun fire caused very heavy German casualties. So here we see a few of this, these, these components of the battle in action, right? He's complaining that the German artillery can't do anything to support him and his regiment. Um, and of course, he uh, feels the effect of that rolling barrage that's just in front of the Canadian infantry. Um, I want to share, we're getting close to time, but I want to share one uh, other account, this time from the 263rd Regiment, still of the 79th Division. So they're just south of the memorial by several hundred meters. And um, there's a lieutenant in this uh, regiment, Lieutenant Bitkow. And like many Germans, his Battle of Vimy Ridge doesn't last that long because he gets a fairly severe wound in the first moments, right in the chest. He doesn't specify if he was shot by you know, a machine gun or a light machine gun or a rifle or if he was hit by shrapnel, but he's hit in the chest. And um, this is how he describes the experience of being wounded. He says, my heart was like lead in my throat. My breath stuck. Blood ran into my mouth. My strength gave out and my senses began to dim. So essentially, he's not doing very well. And his comrades carry him down into a dugout, but he can't be evacuated. There's absolutely no way in that kind of conditions under that kind of fire. So he's lying helpless, badly wounded in this dugout when uh, when the battle continues, right? When the Canadians eventually capture the trench that his unit was responsible for defending. And so he writes about his experience then lying helpless in the dugout. More shouting. They're already in the trench above. Then it got quiet, very quiet, 
until the foreign sounding come out. There's light. Quick considerations shot through my dulled head. What will they do? Will they throw grenades into the dugout? If one lands under my bed, I'm a goner. Will they beat me to death with rifle butts? It would be better to shoot myself, but the revolver's on the table and I can't move. Then a Tommy came through the tunnel, looked cautiously around the corner with a big revolver in his hand. He searched the dead and left to bring his buddies. So since we have the story, of course, it means that Lieutenant Bitkow survived and was not killed um, as a wounded man by the Canadians in this case. But you can see that's the fear. And it's not an unfounded fear. I mean, the killing of wounded or the killing of men trying to surrender is not that uncommon, including by Canadians. I mean, Canada's most famous, probably, um, historian of the First World War, Tim Cook, uh, earlier in his career, wrote an, a very, very comprehensive article on the topic of Canadians killing Germans who are in the, in the process of trying to uh, surrender. So this is something that's racing through the mind of a German lieutenant lying there helpless um, in the dugout. And a Canadian account is also sort of related to this. A little bit south of where Lieutenant Bitkow is fearing for his life until he is spared and, uh, and treated and recovers afterwards, there's a Canadian private, Gordon Little. He's in the 3rd Canadian Battalion. And when he gets into the German trenches, he notices it's, it's pretty quiet. Most of the Germans have, have fled or been killed by the initial bombardment and the start of the rolling barrage. But he says this, one exception was a lone German soldier who was unarmed and in a state of extreme hysteria from shell shock and was getting down on his knees and putting up his hands over and over again. Somebody said, shoot the son of a bitch. And somebody did. I concluded that not all sons of bitches were in the German ranks. So an incident like that is why Lieutenant Bitkow is so afraid when he's in the situation that he's in. And it's probably why uh, Grenadier Schröder decided to make a run for it rather than risking more contact uh, with the enemy as well. I have a few more accounts, but uh, I think one of, with this one I'll just summarize. Um, a 17 year old German soldier by the name of Hermann Kraft was captured, but um, his account's quite interesting. I think, you know, he wrote it after the war, and so. There are always weaknesses to uh, memories and accounts written after the war. And he wrote that uh, one of the Canadian soldiers was, as he calls it, quote, a red Indian with war paint and everything, with a club. That was not very common. Uh, there were, of course, Indigenous Canadians in the, in the CEF, but uh, they had uniforms. They didn't really wear war paint. So he sort of embellished that for the post-war audience but it's still kind of an interesting uh, idea that he would think of that. So, of course, then all this is happening. The Germans lose the ridge to the Canadian Corps. We see here German prisoners carrying back wounded. Another picture from the photographer. And here we have, he did a series, this photographer did, Canadian photographer, Ivor Castle did a series of dual portraits, let's say, of German prisoners. They're not named unfortunately, right? This is part of the heritage we have of them being the enemy. We don't uh, extend all the same amount of, uh, of detail. So we don't know who these, who these German soldiers are, which maybe makes their images uh, more impactful in some way. Um, but there are just uh, four that I chose for us today. So what do the Germans do with the battle? What does it mean to them? And I'll try to be quick for the summary here. Um, this is a little, um, oh, I'm thinking only German words now because I'm seeing it's an Ausschnitt. It's an excerpt. There we go. It's an excerpt of a little report in a popular history that was published during the war. So this came out, this book came out, the war wasn't yet over. And it's a summary of what happens on those days. 
Um, I didn't want to break the binding. So on the left, you can see here, the, the scan is not that great, but that's 9th April. And it says basically uh, the English are able to uh, take some German positions near Arras, but the main thing is no breakthrough. So basically the German point of view is, well, we lost some trenches, but there's no breakthrough that's going to make an impact on the strategic situation. And in some sense, they're right. To them, the main thing is the big French offensive in the south, for which Vimy and the Battle of Arras are a diversion, that fails, right? The famous Nivelle offensive on the Chemin des Dames fails. So for the Germans, yes, they had to give up some ground. Yes, they gave up a good position at Vimy, but it's not a war-winning thing by any stretch of the imagination at all. That doesn't mean it's without any significance. The Crown Prince Ruprecht, for example, said that if we can't recapture a position like Vimy, do we have a chance of winning the war, right? Not that Vimy itself is war winning, but that's a sign that the Germans are weaker than their enemies. The performance of the commanders also comes under some criticism, right? Von Falkenhausen, He's relieved as a sixth army commander, not just because of Vimy, but also because of his performance with respect to the larger British advances to the south at the, around Arras. The criticism of him is that he didn't implement this defense in depth tactic properly in the sense that he was too slow to bring up the reserves and he kept them a bit too far back, which ended up meaning that they couldn't recapture the ridge before it was entirely lost. And going up that steep eastern side is just not a realistic possibility. Von Fassbender, though, the corps commander, he actually gets decorated, not for the actions at Vimy, but for the holding action a couple of weeks later. So basically, the German high command says, you did a great job because you prevented a serious strategic breakthrough. That's the German priority from, from the top, right? Um, there are an unknown number of Germans who were killed on the ridge. We don't have exact records. 4,000 or so were taken prisoner. Um, two divisions lost approximately 7,000 killed and wounded between them. So if you add the third the German division, it'll be higher than that. We, at least in Canada, what, what we often hear about is all these 3,598 dead on Vimy Ridge. Yes, that's how many Canadians died uh, in the battle. But, I mean, the real total for the Battle of Vimy Ridge is somewhere probably up closer to maybe as, maybe as high as 10,000, depending on the proportion of, of dead and wounded. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. And on a closing note, let's say, ah, yes, here's... Um, Here's the, the result of all of this. This is the large German cemetery not far from Vimy Ridge. It's a, a common cemetery. So it's, there've been um, burials from other part of the front and so uh, over the years, which looks like this today. It has about 44,000 in it. So I encourage you to go and visit that the next time you're at Vimy as well. Um, here we have another period illustration. Yes. I wanted to close with the faces of the, of the two prisoners that I chose for the advertisement, for the, the Western Front Association advertisement. I don't know, I feel like they have quite an interesting look. They have different looks, right? I mean, make of it what you will, but I see a bit of exhausted defiance in a way, maybe a little bit in the soldier on the left, but um, it's hard to read. And to me, that's part of the curiosity that draws me to this other side of the story, because it takes a lot more digging to get close to it. And there are a lot of contradictions in uh, the way that I feel about it, and perhaps in the way that you feel about it as well. And I'll leave you with one last uh, quote from the German side. And one of the reasons why I think it's an interesting one is because I swear, if you didn't know, if I didn't give it away already, you would think it's a typical Canadian uh, or, or British account, right? So here we go. 
The fierce battle over Vimy Ridge was fought to a standstill. To be able to call oneself a Vimy warrior was from then on a high honor. In the hearts of the warriors and their loved ones who lived through it all back in the homeland, the memory of the days of heroic glory and deepest sorrow glows indelibly at the Battle of Vimy Ridge. That patch of earth has been sanctified by the rivers of noble blood and innumerable heroic graves. Now, the language is exaggerated, but this was written in the 20s when Canadians were writing similar in similar types of ways. And this was written by General Dietrich, the commander of the 79th Reserve Division that was basically destroyed on Hill 145, where that monument now stands. So that quote to me is one of the, one of the more interesting ones that I've come across because of that similar feeling um, in a way, the similar language. There is today no real public consciousness or public memory of uh, the Battle of Vimy Ridge or the Battle of Arras, uh, for that matter, in Germany. The whole First World War is overshadowed by the legacy of the, of the Second World War. But I think that um, for us tonight, anyway, my goal was to open that window a little bit to hopefully uh, close that language and cultural gap to some extent, or at least make it narrower, and to share with you the perspective of the Germans at Vimy Ridge. And I hope I was able to do that. So thanks to the Western Front Association again, and thanks to Luke for reappearing. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Jesse. As, as I expected, it was a fascinating talk. Just before we go into the, uh, the Q&A, and I've got a couple of questions already that people have sent in. I know there's a couple of additional slides that I know you'd like to share. So if you'd like to share them. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that. I want to share with you folks just two quick slides because the Western Front Association has been kind enough to allow me to say a word about a charity that I work with here in Vienna. It's run by Ukrainians. It's called Ukraine. And you can see the address there. And they send humanitarian aid, mostly medical supplies. They buy ambulances with uh, donated funds. They buy medicine. They buy medical, um, medical devices. They put together emergency uh, paramedic backpacks, and they send these, of course, to Ukraine, to people who need them, to people who live near the front, uh, and to the people helping them. And so this is an important cause for me personally. If you feel the same way, I would uh, appreciate it very much if you would consider uh, checking out their website. Uh, to prove to you that they're that they're legit, here's me with one of the donated, uh, well, one of the ambulances we bought with the donations that I drove to uh, to Lviv uh, last fall, and my next trip is coming up at the end of May, and we want to fill a truck with medical supplies, so we'd really uh, appreciate your help with that. I feel duty bound uh, morally and ethically, but also personally, my partners from Ukraine and. You know, I don't want her family or our friends who live there, frankly, and, and this is what it boils down to, I don't want them to be killed. And I don't want them to live under occupation for the rest of our lifetimes. And so that's my motivation. And um, if you want, please check them out. And thanks again, Luke, for letting me get that in. And that's it. Thank you so much. I think that's a very sobering thought at the end there. First question comes from uh, Tony Stiles. Um, and Tony said, my great uh, uncle, uh, Private Charles Stiles, Third Worcesters, was killed in action at Vimy Ridge on 28th of April, 1916. He was in a listening post when the Germans detonated a mine which left Grenz Crater. Could you tell me anything about the action at Grenz from the German perspective, please? I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. I apologize, but my focus was really on, I hate to say it, but my focus was really on those four days of the famous battle. Because as a Canadian, of course, I've been soaked with this, you know, with this uh, point of view. And I really just wanted to uh, learn more about the other side. So I don't know much about that action. But there is, and now, of course, it's, uh, there is a memoir from a German mining engineer 
who was on the ridge, I believe at that time. So in 1916, he was there. He transferred out just before the Canadians arrived. Um, there is a published uh, translated memoir. And uh, unfortunately, I forget the name, but if it comes to me, I will, uh, I will try to contact the Western Front and, uh, and get to you. You can write me. If you Google my name, you might find my website. Write me the question. I'll see if I can, if, I'll see if I can look up the name, of that, uh, the name of that memoir. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, nice question here from uh, Melvin Sexton, um, who said, uh, please could you ask how the German army was supplied with food provisions and other welfare, including medical, if mainland Germany was suffering civilian starvation? Was the army given priority at the cost of the general population? Yes. It absolutely was. Um, yeah, because of the squeeze, you know, the German authorities have a decision to make. We can't properly feed the civilian population and our army of, you know, five, six, seven million men. Um, and so the army got the priority. And their level of nutrition, let's say, was still fairly reasonable at this time. Now in 1918, we start to get pretty pretty dicey and they're stopping and plundering allied supply depots in the big offensive in spring 1918, but they're still doing okay. They don't have anywhere near the quality or quantity of, of food that the allies have, but it hasn't reached absolute critical proportions in the army yet. But of course, there's an exchange, right? When they go home on leave, they see the conditions there. And when they write letters home, of course, so they transmit uh, the front problems as well. So there's kind of a mutually, there's a connection there that, that uh, the impact of the food problems at home, there is an impact on the, on the troops at the front and eventually then also vice versa. Um, and this is, one of the, this is one of the problems that Germany faces in 1918 because basically society doesn't isn't able to support the war anymore anymore by the end and this is one of the reasons because their government cannot provide basic human necessities like fuel to heat and food to eat and this is true of austria hungary as well to an even greater extent at least on the austrian side the hungarian side is a bit uh, had it had it easier because they had more agricultural land but yeah they pri they prioritize the army at the cost of uh, civilian quality of life and health and that is one of the things that costs them the war, because it's one of the reasons why Germany cracked uh, from the inside, as well as being defeated on the battlefield. Thank you. Um, question from Paul Cullum, um, who says, how well did the Bavarian and Prussian divisions coordinate? Yeah, I think it's a question that comes up uh, fairly regularly, right? Because we know of the differences, we know maybe of the rivalries, uh, the they don't like each other that much when you ask them, even today, you know, I lived in what was Prussia in Berlin for a while. And now I live in um, the Southern German cultural sphere in Austria. So yeah, there's a, definitely a rivalry and there was at the time as well. But after Germany unified in 1871, of course, by force of arms, right? In By defeating France in the Franco-Prussian war, they, allowed the Bavarians to keep some more autonomy with their armed forces. So they had some special this and some special that and different uniforms and stuff. But by 1914, it's kind of academic. So there's one Imperial army, there's one command structure, there's one supply uh, sort of chain, et cetera, et cetera. So with the exception of maybe you know, if you're at a crossroads and the military policeman who's directing traffic is a, a Prussian and you're a Bavarian and he makes you wait just a little bit longer just to be a Prussian, um, there's no real significant uh, role in those regional divisions um, in terms of battlefield performance or, you know, command and control and that sort of thing. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Bill Twist, um, who's, who's, who says it was a great brief, briefing. And thank, thank you. Uh, it says, you cited three old Gothic texts. Where did you get the Prussian and Bavarian records? 
a combination of places. Um, I cited those three uh, books, which are in, in fractal script, as it's um, as it's called, Frakturschrift. One was published using um, period accounts. Uh, it was kind of a, it was an interesting thing. It's a whole series. There's about 50 uh, volumes in that, in that series. And it's using, they used some um, files from the Imperial Archives, the Reichsarchiv, which is indicated on the title, the cover of the book as well. But they also, um, they wouldn't have used this word, but they kind of crowdsourced it at the time. And they had a lot of veteran officers collect information and accounts from their regiments, which were then used to tell these personal stories and so on. So there are those like period or almost period publications, and they rely partly on archival records and partly on you know other kinds of uh, accounts that were gathered. But as I say, I'm standing on the on the shoulders of other historians who've done a lot of archival work like Jonathan Boff, who really looked into the papers of the Crown Prince, for example, in, in his book called Heg's Enemy, or um, these records that survived World War II, which were used, for example, Prussian some Prussian records uh, by Sheldon, Jack Sheldon, who's done a lot of writing on the German army. But most Prussian records were destroyed in 1945, right, in the bombing of, of Berlin. What we have from them existed outside of that main archive. And so that's, uh, that's what I relied on. I think that, that we, we've got another question, actually, that probably uh, it's a natural follow on for that question. And, and you may have partly answered it already, but um, John Azar, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, sorry if I'm not, John, but how deep is the pool of personal stories from German soldiers? Now, that depends entirely on whether you read German, <laughs> because um, it's nowhere near as deep as uh, the pool of British stories, right? Because the war has a different place in post-1918 German history. The interest just was not there for decades upon decades. And so we have to rely on a smaller pool, but it is still, it's still reasonably substantial. It suffers from some weaknesses, but those, you know, memoirs or accounts that were published in the twenties, like some of the ones I used for this evening's talk or interviews later, um, one of, the, one of the first German history books that I was able to read when I was learning German was, an, was a series of personal accounts. It was just some guy, some West German guy got interested in the late 80s and went around, put advertisements in newspapers, asking for, are there veterans in, in you know, seniors' homes and stuff? And he just, on his own, as a volunteer, went around and interviewed them. And he published it in a massive, you know, 700 page uh, compendium that I bought and then struggled through. So there are a lot of accounts, but it's not to compare with the situation in uh, Britain. That's uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I believe that that uh, brings us to our time uh, this evening. But I really just want to say, Jesse, thank you so much for coming along this evening and um, sharing your thoughts. on It was a fascinating talk. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, thanks again for the invitation. Great. More than welcome. And for everybody else, we will be back later in the month and details of the next webinar are on the Western Front Association website. So thank you very much, everybody. And good night. Man.